How is it? Good man. Can see him? She's not well. Oh, she's not well either. Oh. You said that? Anne, yeah. Yeah. Joyce is not well either. Oh. So we've got one or two friends not well this morning. Rachel, we see him. Oh, Rachel's not well, is she? Yeah. So we've got a few friends who are unable to get along this morning, so we can remember them. Um, I just want to start with a, because it's New Year, we we'll start with a psalm which has got some good thoughts in it. Um, psalm 31, so if you've got a Bible, we'll turn to that. If you haven't got a Bible, I can quickly get one out of the cupboard for you, if you want. Does anybody need a Bible? Okay, that's so. Excuse the temporary PA system. If it's too loud, it'll tell me and I'll try and knock it down a little bit from the back. So we <coughs> quickly get something together this week. You might hear Nick singing rather loud if you're at the back as well. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to work or I hope so. So we're just going to read from Psalm 31. Beginning at verse 14. Right. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face shine upon your servant. Save me for your mercy's sake. Do not let me be ashamed. O Lord, I have called upon you. Let the wicked be ashamed. Let them be silent in the grave. In the grave. Let the lying lips be put to silence, which speak insolent things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. O oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you. In the presence of the sons of men, you shall hide them in the secret place of your presence. From the plots of man you shall keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of time. <coughs> Blessed be the Lord, for he has shown me his marvellous kindness in a strong city. For I said in my haste I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried out to you. O oh, love the Lord, all you his saints. For the Lord preserves the faithful and fully repays the proud person. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all you who hope in the Lord. Well, I'm sure there's a verse that each of us could just take out there from the New Year somewhere that we could apply to our heart and to our life. So, happy New Year to you all, anyhow. <laughs> and, um, yeah, that'd be a good thought to think about. We've got a few notices. We've got, I've just mentioned three of our friends who are on well. Remember, Nick is still, is still struggling on, aren't you, Nick? Um, yeah, I did. Um, we had a message from uh, Jeremy Wilson's mum during the week. He's uh, he's struggling a little bit because he's got the uh, uh, lead into his body for this um, kidney nice. dialysis, and he mustn't get it wet, so it's a bit difficult for him to bath and shower properly. But he, he's um, they're hoping that if he can get strong enough, he might even be able to phase or go back to work for a little while before his um, kidney transplant. Um, and, and Joy's mum as well is still not very well, so we remember her too. Um, we, we keep these ones on here constantly. They're, they're things that are on the news all the while. We need to remember those two situations. And don't forget, we haven't put it on there, but there's still people being held hostage after all of these weeks um, in Gaza. So remember them as well. And then we've been asked to pray uh, for itinerant preachers. People go around taking the services at different churches. Um, and to thank God for, you know, that's quite a lot of work, isn't it, you know, for people to get ready and prepare a service if they travel to another church. Um, at the bottom there, we've got pray to the Lord that they'll be kept safely as they travel around, and that's quite an important thing as well, that we want them to be inspired by the Holy Spirit as they take the word around. And that, you know, and I always think that when you prepare a sermon, you learn more yourself because you've got to go through it all yourself, so it's good that we've got there that they will um, be blessed as they study God's word. And I think there should be a blessing for people who go around and do this 
but we need them to do it. And we thank God for that. So you can remember them during the week as well. And don't forget, we've put on the list as well, we're still going to pray for Yemen, which is one of the places where it's real difficult to be a Christian. They face a lot of persecution. So we'll remember that. So let's have a little prayer, and then we'll have our first song. Father, we thank you that we can come together this morning. And uh, we pray, Lord, as we just join together, we'll be led by your Spirit. We pray, Lord, you'll take away all those thoughts that would distract us. And you know, just, Lord, shut us in here with you. Don't let us worry about what's going to happen later on today or during the week. But just to be here with you just for this hour or so. And it's good, Lord, that we can come round the Lord's table and share communion on this first Sunday of the new year. So we ask, Lord, that you'll draw near to us. Bless us as we gather to you as well, Lord. May this be a good time of blessing for each one of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to think, sing our first song this morning. Last song. And you might think it's a bit of a Christmas song, but the wise men did turn up after the Lord Jesus was born, so we're going to sing We Three Kings.
can't be here for other reasons. We know there's one or two of them as well. But we do pray for Joyce and we pray for Anne, we pray for Rachel. And we pray, Lord, that your hand will continue to be upon Nick. Thank you that he's here this morning, Lord. We pray you'll give him comfort as he has to um, travel around over these weeks waiting for his operation, Lord. So please be with um, our friends who are struggling at the moment, Lord. And uh, may they soon be back to health and strength, we ask. But Lord, we thank you that we can come here this morning. Um, we've got the floor up in the church next door and everything's a little bit different for the moment. But we thank you that we're in here, Lord. We've got a place to meet. And we can get by, and Lord, we, you know the situation, and I'm sure you're pleased that we're here anyhow. So it's, it's just good, Lord, to be with our friends here this morning. We thank you, Lord, that we promise that when we join together, that you'll be here right in the midst, Lord. And I pray as we go through this time this morning, we'll really sense you amongst us this morning as well. May we go home from here feeling blessed today. We thank you that you're a God whose blessings reach far beyond and much further than we ever think or expect, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that you brought us... Uh, right through this past year and into this new year as we stand here on the first Sunday of this new year, Lord. And we look forward to what's going to happen in the year ahead. We pray, Lord, for this church. We pray for the folk who attend here regularly, week by week. And we pray, Lord, your blessing upon us all. We think of the people in the village who live around, Lord, and we just pray to for them. And we ask, Lord, that it might please you that we could reach out to them as well. There's, we know there's people in this area who are uh, hurting. We know there's people who need to come to know you, Lord. And we, we just desire, Lord, that uh, your hand would reach forth and touch them, Lord, that you would change their lives and draw them to you. Lord, we know that you're a God of miracles and you can work miracles in this area as well. And we do pray, Lord, that we might see that in the coming months of this year. So, Lord, too, we, we pray for this world in which we live in. And we know that last year was a year of upheaval. And at the moment, this year seems to be going much the same way, Lord. But we pray for these areas that we've mentioned this morning of uh, Russia and the Ukraine, we pray for Israel, and we pray for the situation in the Gaza there, and we remember those people who are held hostage, Lord, they've been there for weeks, and we don't really know what condition they're in, but we know it must be an extremely stressful situation for them. And we think of all those who've been bereaved, and we think of those who've been wounded and injured and maimed, Lord, and we, we know that war is a terrible thing, and so we do pray, pray for peace in these regions, Lord, for a cessation to the fighting. But we know, Lord, that what we're seeing, especially in Israel, is what we read about in your word, that there is going to be times of trouble and strife before you come again. And so, Lord, we should be preparing our hearts and just getting ready, Lord, for the fact that your return cannot be too far away. And we thank you, Lord, that you do show us these signs, although they are quite awful and they're quite fearsome, Lord. It's what your word tells us. And, and the Bible has never been a place of gentleness, Lord, for when it comes to these things. We, we look at the Old Testament, we see that to establish the King of Israel, it was fought by uh, many battles and many people lost their lives. And when the Lord comes to establish his kingdom on earth, it's going to be a similar situation. There will be people who lose their lives. There will be bloodshed. And we, we know that the, this is just what is going to happen, Lord. So help us to be people of prayer. Help us to be observant of what's happening as well, to be aware of the times in which we live in. We do pray for our government and the land in which we live in, Lord. And there's many things happening in this land which I'm sure don't please you. They don't please us. And we pray, Lord, for again, for wisdom for our government too. But we thank you, Lord, that um, we have prayer. And we were here on Wednesday night. And we were talking about how we need your Holy Spirit to visit each one of us. And we need you, your Holy Spirit. We need you, your Spirit in our lives, Lord, in order to live our lives as Christians. And that should be our desire and our prayer that you come into our hearts and into our lives, Lord, in a, a much more powerful way. We need to open ourselves up and have that desire, Lord, that you would come upon us, that you would use us for your work, Lord, and prepare us for what you have for each one of us. And maybe not be afraid of that, but give us the courage, Lord, to ask you to come into our hearts in a special, meaningful way, Lord, to make use of each one of us. You've given us all gifts to be used in the work of your kingdom, and may we make use of them, we pray. And so, Lord, we thank you that we're here today. We pray that as we look at your word, as we gather around the table to share the bread and the wine, that you'll just bless it to us, Lord, that we can go away from here encouraged, Lord, with joy in our hearts, knowing that we've met with you this morning. And Father, we do ask all of these things in the precious name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. We've got another hymn to sing. Um, Lord, for the years, and sing that, and then we'll gather around the Lord's table.
it's uh, right before we share communion that we just spend a little time getting right with the Lord. And if we've got you know, other problems, we need to deal with them really, don't we? So that when we come in, you know, we come in the right state. And there's no good coming here with an angry feeling towards somebody or, you know, just being upset with what somebody said to you. Or not even being in the right position with God either. You need to, you know, we've got something that's happened between us and the Lord, just put it right and then, uh, then we can share the bread and the wine and we can be in the right state. So it's good that we do that. I'm just going to read what was in Corinthians. I'm not going to do anything more elaborate than that, but I'm just going to read these verses because I think they're very important to read. This is what Paul writes to the Corinthian church. We've been looking at this on a Wednesday evening. The Corinthian church had many problems, not just around the communion table. But they had many, many problems in all aspects of church life, really. They'd come out of a very sort of pagan situation and they were not really running church as church should be. And so Paul had a lot of things to deal with. And when it came to the communion, uh, how they were dealing with communion, he, had to, he went through this here. <clears throat> aspect, and, and some other aspects as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. But this is the bit we're going to deal with. He says this, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. In other words, he'd already told them that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he gave given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So he just takes a piece of bread. I mean, there might have been unleavened bread, probably wasn't the Passover, but he took a piece of bread and he broke it. And this bread is the symbol of his body being broken on the cross for you and me. In the same manner, he also took the cup, the cup of wine, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We were talking that on Wednesday night, how they probably met on, on, the, on the Lord's Day, they sat around tables, they brought and they shared their food together, and maybe there was a period in that meal where they stopped and they broke the bread and they shared the wine in, in, that, in that sort of a church lunch sort of atmosphere that they had. It says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's what we're doing now. We are remembering that the Lord Jesus Christ came to this world at Christmas time and he grew up to be a man but the whole aim, the whole purpose was to go to the cross where he gave himself to be a sacrifice for your sin and for my sin. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. You know, when God sent his son to this world, it is a mass, it, it, it's, it's not something that you can even sort of begin to comprehend that God should actually come to this world and offer himself as a sacrifice for your sin and for my sin. And for people to share communion in an unworthy manner, I would think must just incense God. To think that God himself hung on the cross, he was flogged, he was abused, he went through all of that situation. There's nothing more he could have done. And for people to come and share this in a manner that they're not worthy of doing it, God's not going to be too pleased with that. So he's, Paul says, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. In other words, if you're going to abuse the communion, you're going to abuse the Lord's Supper, there could well be a cost. And Paul was actually saying to the Corinthian church, some of you are unwell. Some of you have even passed away because you've mistreated this thing here, this, this time together to share in the Lord's Supper. This is very important. This is a critical thing that the Lord Jesus Christ laid, laid out before us. And so we have to be right in our hearts before we share the Lord's Supper. Well, we're going to take the bread round, right? But before we do so, some, right? Paul's going to just have a little prayer as we share the bread and then we'll share the... As you receive the bread, just eat it and then we'll... All to hold on to the glass and drink the wine together. Father God, we thank you for your love. And we are reminded that there is no greater love than that of Jesus. Mm -hmm. What he did on that cross for us to take our sins, to take our place. So, Father, as we partake of this bread now, we are reminded that through what you've done for us upon that cross, through your bloodshed and broken body, we are made whole mm -hmm. and right with God. Mm. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Amen.
thank you for what you've done for each of us, Lord, and those in the world today. And Lord, I think of you shedding your blood by choice, that we have the choice to follow you. And we really want to give testimony, Lord, to the way you've changed our lives because of this shedding of your blood. And you invite mm -hmm. for us to be part of this, which sometimes seems too incredible to believe that we who have done such terrible things, sinners, people who have rejected you, and yet you still came forward and done this for us. So Lord, I want to thank you now that as we drink this wine together, is to give glory to you, remembrance of that great day, but also remembrance of the future when you come back. So we thank you for the shedding of blood that we're going to celebrate now in the victory. Amen. Amen. Let's hold on to the glass, we'll drink together. As we drink this glass, it doesn't change, <clears throat> doesn't need to change. It just, <clears throat> excuse me, causes us to remember. We're remembering what Jesus did. And when we drink it, we're proclaiming what Jesus did. We're remembering that Jesus died on the cross, and we're saying, he died on the cross for me. And the old hymn, There is a Green Hill Far Away, says, um, there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only, or only he, could unlock the gate of heaven. And let us in. So let's drink and give him the praise and the glory. Lord, we just thank you for this time together as we remembered your death. We thank you, Lord, that it doesn't end there, but the Bible tells us that after three days you rose again. And now you're in heaven. You're waiting to return, Lord, to come and claim your people to take your church to be with you and to establish your kingdom. And Lord, we thank you that because of your love and your grace and mercy that we're part of that. Lord, that we belong to you. Nothing can change that, Lord. One day, we're going to find the fulfilment of what we've just done before you in heaven. And Lord, I always say, what a day that will be. What a day of rejoicing that will be. So thank you, Lord, for these memories, these thoughts, and this proclamation. Thank you for your love to each one of us. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, as I say, if you're prepared, we will we take the collection up in this um, next hymn. It's the goodness of God. Um, but if not, we'll... No, if you're not ready, just let the bag go by.
chapter 6, but um, to start with really we just need to look into 1 Chronicles, so keep your finger in 1 Chronicles chapter 14. I don't know whether you've made any New Year's resolutions this year, I don't usually make any, but I have got one for this year, I've decided I'm going to eat anything I want to. <laughs> I think I can keep that one. <laughs> So we're going to look at 1 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 16. Um, and just read into chapter 15, verse 1. But keep your finger there anyhow. So it says that, So David did as God commanded him, and he drove back the army of the Philistines from Gibeon as far as Giza. Then the fame of David went out into all lands, and the land brought the fear of him upon all nations. And then chapter 15, verse 1. David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the ark of God, and he pitched a tent for it. Okay? So, just keep a marker in your Bible there, keep your finger there, because we'll go back to Chronicles in a minute. The situation is this, that David is now established. He's taken up on um, Jerusalem, it's become his city, he's called it the city of David. Um, Israel is in a good place, it's safe and secure. Uh, he's fought off most of the enemies, he's destroyed them. Um, and David is safe and secure in his new home as well. And um, <coughs> he has in his heart to, uh, to bring the Ark of the Lord back to Jerusalem. That's what in his, was in his heart at this particular moment. The, the Ark of the Lord, that's the symbol of God's presence being with his people. Um, and uh, he wants to bring the Ark of the Lord back to Jerusalem. He wants it to be the centre of, of life in, his, in, in um, Jerusalem, in Israel really. Uh, obviously to be, you know, the centre of worship as well, but the sign of God's presence with his people, that's his desire. And so the, um, David starts to resolve along these lines. And I believe it was in God's heart, or in David's heart also, to honour God. He wanted to honour God as he did this as well. Um, so he's restoring the ark, the presence, the sign of God's presence, in, into the centre of life in Israel, putting it in a prominent position. And if we look at 1 Chronicles 13, uh, yeah, I'm trying to go 13, 1 to 5. Just read there, look. <coughs> Doesn't seem to be quite right order, but never mind. So 1 Chronicles 13, verses 1 to 5. And David consulted with the captains of thousands, the hundreds, and with every leader. 
And David said to all the assembly of Israel, If it seems good to you, and if, and if it is of the Lord our God, let us send out to our brethren everywhere who has left in all the land of Israel, and with them to the priests and Levites who are in their cities, and all the common lands, that they may gather together to us. And let us bring the ark of our God back to us, for we have not inquired of it since the days of Saul. Then all the assembly said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of the people. So David gathered all Israel together from Shehor in Egypt to as far as the entrance of Hamath to bring the ark of God from Kiriath Jerem. So he's consulted the whole nation, he wants to bring everything back there. I don't know if you remember what had happened to the ark, why it wasn't, you know, in a more prominent place in Israel. Do you remember what happened to it? The ark is not a boat, okay? It's not a boat, it's a box in a way, it's a box. And it was overlaid with gold, the top of it being called the mercy seat, and it had uh, two angels or cherubim at the... Yeah, well, <laughs> you'll put me right. <laughs> and then two angels or cherubim at each end, which were with their wings extended, and they were in a sort of a form of worship, you know, as, as they were placed on each other, facing towards each other. And inside the ark, there was a golden jar with the manor in it. Okay? And also, there was Aaron's rod that budded. And I don't know if you're familiar with that story of Aaron's rod. Robert Budded, some people are, some are not. If you go back into the Old Testament, you'll find that in the days of Moses there was a rebellion led by a man called Korah, who said he didn't see why that Moses and Aaron should be the leaders of um, Israel, that anybody or somebody else could do it, probably himself, is what he's really aiming at. And he said that um, he didn't think that Moses was the right person to do it. And eventually what happened was God answers the question by uh, causing an earthquake and Korah and his uh, rebellious friends are swallowed up into the ground. But the outcome of that is that, you know, the next day the, the Israelites are unhappy at what, with what God, the way God has dealt with um, with uh, Korah and that. They're not happy about the situation. They come back to Moses complaining again, saying, you know, we still don't believe that you should be the leader. So God gives another test and he says, I want you to get a, a rod from each of the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel and Aaron will represent the Levites and place them before me and the rod that comes into blossom that will be the sign of the man who's going to uh, I've chosen and it was Aaron's rod that budded and it was Aaron's rod that was actually laid in the ark of the covenant and um, alongside that uh, there was the, the the tablets of the law they were in there as well they were kept in there as law with the, you know, as well but what actually happened to the ark what, what happened to it where had it gone well we did talk about this um, back in 1 Samuel chapter 4 when Israel is fighting against the Philistines and the battle doesn't go well and Israel loses 4,000 men in the battle and they decide that what they'll do is they'll take the ark of God into battle with them um, as more as a good luck charm as anything the way they're looking at it and um, the trouble is they carry it in, they parade it onto the battleground, they go into battle uh, but they lose the ark, the Philistines capture the ark and uh, it was not good for the Philistines to capture the ark. They take it to their temple and they place it in front of their god Dagon. And when they go in there the next morning, Dagon has fell prostrate before the ark and his hands and his head have fallen off. And they're quite fearful and they don't know what to do with it. Not only that, tumors break out all over the people in the area. And they move the ark around to different parts of Philistine, but wherever it goes, there seems to be trouble and people have illnesses and they're inflicted with tumors and problems like that. And so, the uh, Philistines decide, well, the only thing we can do is build a new cart and we'll put the, we'll put the ark on it, we'll put two cows on it that have already calved, they've had their calves, we'll just send it off into Israel and we'll send it back to them and let them deal with it. And um, that's what they did. Uh, and um, it goes back into uh, Israel and actually wanders off, you know, and the people of Kiriath Jir will come and collect them. <coughs> And it's the house, it's kept in the house of a man named Abinadab, and it's kept there for 20 years. And all through the reign of Saul, really, and it's just ignored. And as David says there, it hasn't, it hasn't been part of their worship or their consultation with God in all of that time. And, um, and so this is why David wants to bring it back and, and establish it as part of the, the centre of worship for um, Israel at that particular time. Now, some people, this story we're looking at, some people will actually think, God is a bit unreasonable in this story, right? Some people don't actually like this story very much at all. Um, 
So let's just have a look in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. So it says there, and again David, David gathered the choice men of Israel. This is the same story of Matt Chronicles, but it's just this version of it, right? 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up uh, from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. So he's collected all these people together. It's going to be a, a really big deal. They're all going to go. Um, and they're going to bring back this ark. As I said, nobody thought it necessary to restore it to its rightful place in all these years, right? Uh, but now David is determined to bring it back to the centre of life. Um, it, had, it was important, right? But God had been ignored. God had been left out. And Israel was not in a good place spiritually, especially under the reign of Saul. And the natural fact, you know, it's a reflection of life in this country, isn't it? Because over the past few years, we see how God, God has been sidelined He's been pushed out of national life, and we can start to see the consequences of that, can't we? Now, um, in this land, we, we might all be financially reasonably okay in this country, but by and large, I think most people are spiritually bankrupt. And I think, too, that was the situation that was in, that was in Israel, really, during the days of Saul. And Saul himself became quite spiritually bankrupt towards the end of his reign as well, didn't he? Uh, but I don't know what inspired David. I don't know what got into him. He just copied the Philistines. And he's going to bring the ark back into Israel and he copied the Philistines. And he had a new car built to transport the ark upon it. And we don't please God when we follow the ways of non-Christians, when we follow the ways of the world. That's not pleasing, you know. Man's natural wisdom is not pleasing to God. The way we want to do things. You know, man does not know, the natural man doesn't really know how to please God. And so David did the wrong thing here. And it's so easy, isn't it, for Christians to follow the ways of the world and to get things wrong, and to do the wrong thing. And I don't know whether you noticed this week, but I'm um, sorry to say, that the Methodist Church of Great Britain has just issued a, a new inclusive language guide. I don't know if you've seen that, or looked through it at all. But one of the main points of it is that it's advising Methodists not to use gendered terms. Um, and, you know, gendered terms, so... You probably know what's coming, don't you? You're not allowed to use the words husband and wife anymore. And the reason they say for such language is allegedly it assumes what is not the reality for quite a lot of people. So I don't know what I'm going to call you, Patty. You're either going to buy the big, the ball and chain, or the trouble and strife. I don't know. <laughs> you know. What does Paul say in Romans? He says in Romans 1, 22, although they made out to be wise, they became fools. And this is what's happening to the church in this country. We're starting to look silly because we're not sticking to the word of God. God made husbands and wives. As simple as that. And if we make it differently, we're going to look silly. We're going to look fools. Anyhow, back to verse 3 and 4. Look. So they set the ark of God on a new car and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, and Uzzah and Ahiah, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new car. And they brought it, um, and then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments, of fir wood, on harps, on stringed instruments, tambourines, and on sistrums and on cymbals. Who knows what a sistrum is? No? It's sort of like a, a metallic rattle. I don't know if it's one, you know, we used to have those ones for football that you spun around and clicked. I don't know if it was that, but it was, it was one that was a metallic type rattle, I think. And so it made quite a lot of noise as well. Um, and so, you know, it's, it, it's a, a brand new car, it's never been used for anything else. You've got Uzzah and Ahia, they're driving it. And this is a real spectacular event, a huge band with all kinds of instruments. As I say, you know, lots of excitement, and the ark has gone to its new home. What could possibly be, or go wrong with that? What could possibly go wrong? You know, when I was a young boy, um, I was at school, it was quite small, but my mum and dad used to trust me with the job of lighting the fire so that when they came home in the evening there'd be a nice warm fire at tea time. We used to call it tea time, Penny. Um, and I don't know, if, if you're old enough to remember lighting a coal fire, you know that sometimes it was hard to start it up. And when it wouldn't draw, uh, in our home, we stood a poker up in the hearth and we put a piece of newspaper up. Did you ever do that? Yes. 
Good, I'm not the only one. <laughs> but sometimes it would draw and sometimes it wouldn't. And on this particular case, although I threw sugar on it to help, which another one of my mum's plans, it would not light. And I thought, well, I've got to get the fire light for when um, my mum and dad come home. So I resorted to the last resort. I chucked some paraffin on it. <laughs> And you know, you know what happened, there's this hoo's roaring and the chimney's alight and I'm in panic. I'm only a little boy. I know my mum and dad, my mum rather, my dad's at work, my mum's round the shops doing the shopping for the co-op. So I came running round the corner just as my mum is saying to her sister, some poor woman's got a chimney fire. <laughs> but you see, I was trying to do the right thing but I did it the wrong way. And this is just what David is, trying to do the right thing but he did it the wrong way. And it's so easy to do that, isn't it? To try and do the right thing and do it the wrong way. And so verse 6, And when they came to Nashon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. So the ox pulled the cart along, and it's a bit of an uneven floor, the cart wobbles, and it looks like the ark might possibly <clears throat> topple off the cart. It was just an action of instinct, you know, a concern that the ark might come crashing off the car. And if you was there, if I was there, we might do exactly the same thing. Because it's just an instinctive action. It happens in a split second, you know. It's, it's a quick reaction. You don't have time to think about it. And that's what he did. He just put his hand to steady it. But look, verse 7. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died by the ark of God. This is what people struggle with. How, how could a, a loving God do something like that? You know, that, you know, God is love. He cares for us. You know, and was that he had good intentions. You know, yes. he, his heart was not wrong, really. We say you know, he, he wanted to protect the ark. And how could God strike him there? That's not fair. That's not right. That God should do that. And the big problem with that kind of thinking is this. God calls the shots. God's in charge. And God says the way things should be done. Not us. Not whether we think it's fair or whether we think it's right. It's what God says is right. That's what matters. You know? Um, you know, the sons of Aaron uh, were destroyed because uh, 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 Nadab and Abihu were the sons of Aaron were destroyed because they made sacrifices with fire from the wrong source. They were sacrificed to God, but they used the wrong fire. And so they were destroyed. If you go to Joshua chapter 7, there's a man called Reagan. He steals some stuff that he shouldn't, he shouldn't have had it in his tent. But his whole family are destroyed because of that. We, we went through Acts a while ago, didn't we? We you know, saw that Ananias and Sapphira. They both dropped down because they didn't God, give God the respect that he deserved. They did things wrong. And we've just read a communion, haven't we? How, how some people mistreated the communion service. And, and, and Paul says, and some of you are weak, you're sick, and some of you even died because of the lack of respect from God. Because people are not doing it God's way, not following God's instructions. We've got to be careful about that. Psalm 96, 9 says, Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. We've got to remember that God is holy. He's, he's far above us, right? Let the whole earth tremble before him. Yes, it's a big thing, isn't it, to, to come into the presence of the Lord. We do it so easily, but if we read the scriptures, we realise it's a real big thing to come into the presence of the Lord. So that the whole earth tremble before us. God makes the rules, we have to follow them. That's how it is. And the thing is, you know, if you think about it, are you honouring God in your life? You know, do you really give God the honour? You know, because our instincts, the things we might, you know, come that might come natural to us, you know. Um, may lead us to do church or do our Christian life the way that we want to. And the way we like might not be the way that God wants it. So we have to be a bit careful on these things, don't we? And it says in verse 8 here, look, and David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah, and he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day, which really means an outburst. You know? So that David's first, his, his first reaction is to be angry at what God had done. He was angry at the way God responded. Why should this happen? Why has God done this? He was only doing the, the, the right thing, just the way that we would think. But you see, the ark's place, as I've said before, is, is right at the centre of the tabernacle, at the centre of worship, behind the curtain or a veil that was as thick as a man's hand, a real thick curtain, right? 
and the Shekinah glory would hover over the tabernacle, right over where the ark was kept. It'd be right there, you know, with God in the, God in, Emmanuel, God with us, God right in the centre of, of, of worship. Um, and no one could draw near into this air, no one could come into this presence of God without the shedding of blood. You just couldn't do it. Why? Why couldn't you do it? Because sinners are made righteous, not by our own doing, not by anything that we do, but by the shedding of the blood of David's son, who we're thinking about right now. You know, he, he, just, just tell me, was, I, I, I want you to read this because it's important. Hebrews um, chapter 9, verses 19 to 22. Hebrews uh, 9, chapter, uh, verse 19. It says this, and we need to understand how important it was when, when the Israelites came to worship God, you know, how, how serious a business it was. We can treat it quite casually when we come to church, but it's not. It says in, in verse 19 of chapter 9 of Hebrews, For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. This is, this is serious, you know. We, and, and, and you, know, you couldn't just touch the tablet. You couldn't just touch the ark. You, didn't, couldn't, you couldn't do it, you know. Now, on, the, on the day of atonement, when the priest went in, he, he had you know, the blood of a bull had to be sacrificed to make atonement for all the people, to put the right with God. And all of this was disregarded. They set this ark on a cart, which was not the right thing to do. They set it on a cart, and when Uzzah reached out and touched the ark, right, which represented the very presence of God, the parade was over. Because he did the wrong thing. He did the wrong thing. And it says there, look, look verse 8, David became angry because the Lord had break against Uzzah, and he called the name of the place, Perez Uzzah, to this day, right? David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David, but David took it aside into the house of Obed Edom, and the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite, three months, and the Lord blessed Obed Edom and all his household. See, again, as I say, the problem was that David had good intentions. He wanted to do the right thing, but he was doing it his way. He was not doing it God's way. And we, we can all be like that concerning, you know, the things that God has laid out for us. It's too easy to say, that will be all right. It's too easy to do that. God's in control. Don't forget, it's his rules, whether you like it or not. We don't really get to say that. Our job is to be obedient, not to dictate what happens. And David was angry when God reacted to, you know, to God's reaction. The first thing is he, he was angry. You know? he, he reacted to God. To him, he was doing a good thing in his eyes, and he didn't like God's reaction. He put the ark, as I said, on a new car. That's not the way the Lord wanted things done. The ark actually had rings in four corners for the poles to go through it. So it would be carried, wouldn't it, in order, in order for it to be carried. It was the Levites who had to carry the ark. They lifted it onto their shoulders, they carried it, and the ark was not to be touched. And the descendants of um, Kohath, who, who had the responsibility of transporting all the holy objects, they were not allowed to touch them. They had the job of transport, but they, wouldn't, they mustn't touch them or they would die. And the Lord of God's word said, do not touch. And Uzzah touched it. And God struck him dead. And you think, well, are you surprised at that? That's what God has ordered. That's what God said would happen. And as I say, David, he has his reaction. He has two reactions, right? First of all, he's angry with God. God didn't do what David wanted. He didn't, you know, I'm doing a good thing, so God should be pleased with me. And we've all thought like that. That's how David thinks. God was not as gracious as David wanted him to be. David's view of God was not quite right at this particular moment. And, and David was just forgetting how holy God is. And that's a big error that we all slip into. 
we forget just how holy God is. And, and then secondly, he's got another reaction there. He's actually afraid of God. David is fearful of the Lord, isn't he? He, 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 he was afraid that something um, else might happen, something even worse, you know, and rather than risk another disaster, the ark has moved into the house of this man named Obed Edom. You know, we've got to understand that right from the beginning of creation, God had a plan. There was a plan that God had, and it, it was a way of bringing sinners to himself. God had that there. It was all organised, right? His son, his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus, whose birth we've just celebrated, would die to take your place, my place on a cross. That's what we do. And your sins would be removed from you and they'd be transferred onto him as he hung upon the cross. And as he, he would pay the price of your sins as he hung upon the cross by the shedding of his blood. His body would be sacrificed, his blood would be shed, and he would be paying the price for your sin and for my sin. And because of that blood that's shed on the cross by the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I, we can come to God and we can say, I accept that sacrifice, I know I'm a sinful person, I ask forgiveness from you, I'm going to turn away from my bad ways while I walk towards you, Lord, and God will accept you. And you can be adopted into his family, you can become a child of God, and you can become a citizen of heaven, right? And when you recognise that, when you understand, you realise that's the only way that a sinful person can come to God. There is no other way. God doesn't say, well, just think what you want, you know. It, it's only through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that you will be accepted. It's the only way. There isn't another choice. You, you could say, well, look, well, people will say, I know people will say, look, I've got my ideas about heaven. I've got my own ideas about eternal life. And it seems to me that if a person feels right about something, what they're doing, then God should find them acceptable and find them a reasonable person. Whatever path they choose to follow, if they're happy about it, then God should just accept it. God says, no. There's one way, and one way only. And I've told you what it is. Man's reasoning is wrong. Man's understanding is wrong. God is in charge. He makes rules, and it's the cross or nothing. There isn't any other way. You can, you can argue as much as you want. And so we read here, for three months, the ark stayed in the house of Obed Eden, and obviously nobody touched it. Nobody went near it. Well, they were near it, but not, not to touch it. But because it, it was in the house of this man, we can go on to read it, that the people who lived there and around there, they're blessed. All who lived there are blessed. Now look, we don't always get a second chance, but when we do, we should take it. David gets one. Look at verse 12. Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed Eden and, and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed Eden to the city of David with gladness. So he, he, heard, he heard of what happened to the house there of Obed Eden. He wanted that blessing in the centre of Israel for himself and for all the people, right? Just turn back with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 15. I did say keep a piece of paper in there. Thought, huh? <laughs> 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verses 11 to 15. So 1 Chronicles 15, 11 to 15. And David called for Zadok and Abiathar the priest and for the Levites, for Uriel, Asiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel, and Amadab. And he said to them, You are the heads of the father's houses of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, you and your brethren, that you may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel to the place I have prepared for it. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles, as, as Moses had commanded them, according to the word of the Lord. This time they did it right. This time they got it right. They were going to go out, they were going to prepare themselves to be right with God, and it was going to be carried on the poles that, uh, that had been prepared to carry the ark on. And so we're back into 2 Samuel 6 verse 13. And so it was, when those who were, were bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, that he sacrificed an oxen and a fat sheep. David went further than God asked him. He was, he was making a sacrifice every six steps. You think, well, how on earth are they ever going to get home? But, but this is what David's doing. He, he's, he's going to get everything perfectly right. He wants to be right before God. 
And so we get the verses 14, 15 there. David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. In other words, he's in his underwear. And so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. This is a real joyous occasion for David and for the people. There was great joy. There was worship of all kinds. And, 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 and you know, on behalf of David and the people, it was a fantastic day before the Lord. There was joy because they knew this time they were doing it the right way. They were doing it the God-pleasing way. They were doing it correctly. There was freedom in their worship because they knew they were doing things the right way. And David could dance before the Lord. They felt this way. They, they had joy because they were doing things God's way, following his instructions. But, there's still another but. Okay? You know, 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 says this, Anyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. And Psalm 34 19 says this, A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers it from them all. And this, the trouble of David is not over yet, because look at verse 16. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. What do you think of that, eh? This is David's first wife, Michal. She was born a princess. She was Saul's daughter. David's behaviour was beneath her. This is not the way she wanted her to see her husband, to see him dancing with joy before the Lord and before the people so they could see him there in his underwear it was too much for her and she despised him. She didn't understand. She just didn't get what, what was going on in David's heart. She didn't see it. The joy of David's heart just left her cold. She was untouched. She was disgusted. Look at him. He's making a fool of himself. That's all she could think of. In front of all the people, or even the slave girls are watching him there in his underwear. That's not the behaviour of a king. And she couldn't see further and beyond that. She didn't have the understanding of the joy that was in David's heart as the ark was coming back into Jerusalem. So verse 17 and 20. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for him. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offerings, uh, offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And then he distributed among the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both the women and the men, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins, so that all of the people departed, everyone to his house. They were all blessed. You know, food was an important thing in those days. Not easy to get off, like just going down Tesco's or Sainsbury's. And so it was a real blessing to be fed. Then David returned to bless his household, right? And as he goes home, look, and Michael, or Michal, the daughter of Saul, comes out to meet him. And David said, how glorious, and she said, how glorious was the king of Israel today, uncovering himself today in the eyes of the maids of his servants, as one of the base fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. Imagine that, he comes home, he's full of the joy of the Lord, everything's been wonderful. And his wife is just so wound up, she can't wait for him to get in the house. She comes out to meet him. And you can see what she thinks. Yeah. You know, watch it. When things are going really well in your Christian life, things are at their best, Satan will attack. And often he'll do it from some, through somebody that you know. The last sort of area where you expect it to come from. She was just so angry and annoyed with him. He was not going to find any sort of a forgiveness in her heart at this particular moment in time. And look, he, he actually gives her a bit of a, 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 a smart reply as well. So David says to my Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all of his house to appoint me rule over the people of, people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore I will play music before the Lord and I will be even more undignified than this and will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maid servant to whom you have spoken, by them I will be, I will be held in honour. See, David's reaction was to remind her, right, that, that God had given him the kingdom instead of her father. And he had every right to worship God and, 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 and show the joy in his heart before God, however he wanted to do it. Because he was doing the right thing in the right way. You know, he wanted to worship God with all that he had. And if you look at verse 23, then you can see how their relation was from that moment on. 
there's a dignity attached to worship. There has to be a dignity attached to worship, right? But that's not an excuse for being miserable. Okay? That's not an excuse. I, I would rather err to the position of David, right? And let us be aware of avoiding enthusiasm. Let's be enthusiastic. When we come before the Lord, let's show the joy that's in our hearts. You know, don't let us think that being joyful in our worship is beneath us and undignified. It's, it's better to be joyful in the, in, in the presence of God now. And I know time's gone Same by, but <laughs> it often does. But we're at the start of a new year, aren't we? And, and, and I, I know that doing everything God's way is not the, the first thought on your mind when you wake up in the morning. That's not the first thing we think about. But, you know, we should. We should think along those lines, really, shouldn't we as Christians? So, let's give it our consideration for the new year. I want my life to be pleasing to God. I want to do things His way. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. We do things our way. We don't want to go down that path, spiritually speaking. So, Let's err on David's side. Let's have a, a joyful Christian life. Let's worship him joyfully. Let, let's do things his way, the right way, and then we will be able to do things joyfully as well, won't we? So, I'm not going to go any further because it's 12 o'clock. <laughs> but there's, there's something to think about as we go into the new year, that we worship God in the right way in our hearts as well. Amen. We're going to sing, To God be the glory, great things he has done. That works all right, <laughs>
Amen.